Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us today for this ninth installment of the Suburban Diagnostics Knowledge Speed series of webinars. Today, we'll be dealing with the issue and approach to unresolved anemias. My name is Dr. Vineet Nair, and I will be your moderator for today's event. I'd like to remind everyone that our webinars are intended to be as interactive as possible, and we encourage you to actively participate by submitting as many questions as you like at any time you want during the presentation. To submit the question, simply type the question into the chat box to your right and click send. We will have a consolidated Q&A session toward the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please use the chat box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. Please note, with this webinar, we will be giving certificates of attendance. All those who complete the webinars and wish to be provided with the certificate must fill a form which we will provide to you at the end of the webinars. This form only asks for your email name and title, as well as email. Only those who fill out the form will be provided the certificate. As I mentioned earlier, we will be shining a spotlight today on the issue of unresolved anemias. Anemia in India is a huge health issue. According to one recent cross-sectional study published in the Lancet uh, Journal in December 2019, approximately 50.3% of women and 22.5% of men in India suffer from anemia of one sort or the other. If you factor in the population of India, we are looking at roughly 314 million women and 152 million men having anemia in India. While most of these anemias are straightforward to diagnose and treat, there are many which are not. Our guide through this wilderness today will be Dr. Amar Das Gupta, preeminent hematopathologist and director of medical services at Suburban Diagnostics. Over the past four decades, he has had a storied career in hematopathology at institutions like the Postgraduate Institute for Medical Education and Research, Chandigarh, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, the University of Washington, Seattle, Hammersmith Hospital, London, Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai, and SRL Diagnostics, Mumbai. A fellow of the International Union Against Cancer and of the Indian Society of Hematology and Blood Transfusion, he has over 125 published scientific papers in national and international journals and was also responsible for setting up India's first hybridoma laboratory and India's first cytometry laboratory way back in 1995. Without any further, further verbiage, let me hand over the baton to Dr. Das Gupta. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Vineet, uh, for your kind introduction. And uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in, as I was uh, sharing with Vineet in the COVID uh, pandemic time when everybody is uh, occupied uh, by the uh, virus uh, and uh, you know the thoughts our thoughts are all uh, in one direction uh, it will be a little mundane for many of you to talk about anemia but I thought uh, at least it will give us uh, uh, an outlet uh, to come out of uh, the you know the negative thoughts that we all tend to undergo when we talk about uh, this pandemic nowadays. Uh, as Vineet mentioned, the magnitude of uh, anemia in our country, in terms of the incidence, is uh, you know enormous. And uh, although it's a it's a common uh, entity as far as medical practice goes. Uh, it is not necessarily an easy, uh, uh, you know, condition to uh, deal with in terms of diagnosis as well as management. And uh, today I intend to dwell on these aspects uh, and I try to uh, share with you uh, some experience that we have had uh, in the past in dealing with these kind of uh, situations. Now, to take you all uh, to the same page where uh, we can start with some basic uh, concepts, uh, anemia, as we know, is defined as a drop in hemoglobin below 13 grams per deciliter in males and below 12 grams per deciliter in females, normal being for males 13 to 17 and females 12 to 15 grams per deciliter. Anemia, as uh, one would uh, like to believe, is a disease, but it's not so. Uh, anemia is actually just a sign, and when encountered, uh, 
in clinical practice, it should uh, raise an alarm in the minds of the people or the physicians who are handling these cases because it's caused by a host of conditions, uh, some of which are listed here uh, in passing, that is nutrition deficiency of iron and or vitamin B12 folic acid. Hemolysis can cause uh, destruction of red cells and give rise to anemia, infection, inflammation, and malignancy, loss of blood due to bleeding disorders, uh, and then hypogenerative conditions of the marrow, such as aplastic anemia, pre-leukemia, and leukemia. Uh, the manifestation of anemia um, is in the form of uh, uh, pallor, predominantly accompanied by sometimes jaundice when uh, it is as a result of hemolysis. But it, as we all know that in uh, also megaloblastic anemia, you can get a mild degree of jaundice because of the ineffective hemopoiesis or erythropoiesis that happens inside the bone marrow because of the defective DNA synthesis in the erythroid precursors. And then you have some uh, physical signs that are listed here. But more importantly, the, uh, uh, the impact of anemia uh, on the uh, health of the patient is on account of the fact that hemoglobin, which is reduced in anemia, uh, carries oxygen to all cells in the body. And uh, therefore, the manifestations of anemia are importantly in the form of breathlessness, fatigue, syncopal attacks and cardiac ischemia, uh, especially when patients already have compromised coronary blood vessels or uh, for that matter, uh, cerebral blood vessels. So many patients do manifest as uh, acute attacks of uh, coronary syndrome if, uh, you know, when they become anemic and if that happens very rapidly. So this is something which we must keep in mind when dealing with patients who come with uh, acute coronary uh, syndromes. And as one would expect, the severity and acuteness of these symptoms will depend on the rapidity with which the, uh, the, this condition develops or anemia develops. And uh, on the contrary, uh, or on the other side, when anemia is slowly progressive, as happens in many conditions, uh, body adapts to that, and especially in the uh, congenital anemias or inherited anemias, which develop over time, uh, the body adjust, adjusts to that, and then the symptoms are not so marked or they are much less. So this is something which therefore has to be kept in mind just because somebody is, uh, you know, symptom free doesn't necessarily mean that doesn't have uh, uh, some kind of a morbid condition or even associated higher uh, rate of mortality. So this has to be kept in mind as well. So when we talk about uh, diagnosis of anemia, uh, as many of us know that CBC and blood smear examination constitute the starting point uh, in this condition, like in many other diseases. So a blood examination is the uh, you know, the beginning of investigation in uh, this condition. And depending on the various findings, uh, the results uh, lead us to one or the other direction in terms of uh, A, the subsequent steps in the investigations, as well as even deciding about the, uh, you know, the uh, therapy. So it's very, very important that uh, a lot of attention is paid to the uh, CBC and peripheral blood smear findings when we are talking about uh, investigating cases of anemia. Uh, so the degree of anemia or the hemoglobin level will dictate to us uh, what's the urgency of uh, the condition. So uh, therefore, it's very important that we must uh, have an idea of what is the degree of anemia. Uh, Traditionally and uh, very uh, rewardingly, in fact, uh, looking at the size of red cells in terms of uh, whether these are uh, smaller in size, are of normal size or larger in size, tells us a lot uh, about the 
possible uh, type of anemia and even to uh, hints to the possible etiology of these cases. Uh, and we'll look at that as we go along this talk. Uh, the presence or absence of accompanying cytopenias, for example, leukopenia or thrombocytopenia, uh, will also throw a lot of light on the possible etiology of the anemia. Say, for example, if we have uh, a patient who has low hemoglobin with uh, macrocytic red cells and both leukopenia and thrombocytopenia, uh, the first thing that would come to mind would be the possibility of a uh, nutritional megaloblastic anemia if supported by other uh, signs such as uh, hypersemitic neutrophils in the peripheral blood and things like that. So as we can see, even the uh, uh, the abnormalities of the other cellular lineages uh, will contribute to the uh, possible diagnosis of the cause of this uh, entity. And therefore, this also needs to be looked at. Uh, morphology of red cells, again, uh, cannot be overemphasized, the importance thereof. And, uh, uh, and not only red cells, white cells and platelets will tell us, uh, again, in the same way, what could be the, uh, as I mentioned, in terms of the, say, for example, if we are getting to see hypersemitic neutrophils or shift to the left in the granulocytic series or large platelets and things like that, it will tell us uh, about the possible etiology, uh, about uh, the possible cause that has give, given rise to the condition, uh, uh, in this case, uh, anemia. And as uh, we would uh, understand that the next set of investigations uh, will depend on the all this data, particularly the size and morphology of red cells and the status of white cells and platelets. Now, this is just to uh, orient ourselves to a CBC uh, you know, printout of an automated hematology analyzer. And obviously, this is a normal uh, CBC, and therefore, there is no flag. And this is something which, as a hematologist, hematopathologist, we have to pay attention to the flags because uh, uh, it tells us that, and these are all, of course, based on the uh, you know, the input, inputs that the instrument has been uh, fed with in terms of uh, highlighting the abnormalities that uh, uh, we would like uh, the instrument to highlight to us. So this is uh, very important and therefore attention should be paid to that as well. So as I mentioned, uh, dividing or segregating cases of anemia into uh, microcytic, uh, macrocytic, or normocytic, depending on the size of the red cells, uh, or MCV as we call mean corpuscular volume, uh, it throws a lot of light on the possible uh, etiology of the condition. Say, for example, uh, a patient who has come with microcytic anemia, the entities that should cross our mind when we come across such a case uh, are iron deficiency anemia, beta thalassemia trait, anemia of chronic disorder of some standing, because initially uh, patients of anemia of chronic disorders, which are uh, infection, inflammation, and malignancies, as we know, uh, which can give rise to anemia. But they will happen. that will happen only uh, after the entity uh, has been there for some time. Uh, initially, in fact, the Anemia in these conditions, as listed here in the last column, would be normocytic. So uh, um, an anemia of a chronic disorder of some standing will become microcytic hypochromic. And that is when it will create confusion and uh, dilemma in the diagnosis of uh, a case because it, it may resemble that of uh, iron deficiency anemia. And of course, pseudoblastic anemia as well. So these are the entities which give rise to microcytic red cells. Uh, conditions, of course, which give rise to macrocytic anemia or high MCV are nutritional deficiency of vitamin B12 and or folic acid. But here, of course, you'll be uh, observing also some degree of pancytopenia, 
uh, which again is something which can be seen in patients with plastic anemia where macrocytosis is not uncommon. So between these two entities, just on the basis of uh, CBC and smear examination may not be always easy uh, to distinguish. And therefore, further investigations may be required. But when we come across such a picture, at least we exclude all other possibilities and focus on these two entities. And that helps us in uh, designing the uh, subsequent uh, set of investigations. And that is also, of course, uh, a major contribution of a good CBC and a, a good smear examination. <clears throat> uh, Macrocytic anemia can also happen uh, in cases of uh, hemolytic anemia. And uh, as uh, you can imagine, and that will happen uh, when uh, there has been an acute attack of uh, hemolytic anemia. And that uh, is because the patients of uh, hemolytic anemia, when they have an acute hemolysis, uh, have a subsequent reticulocyte response. And the reticulocytes are larger cells, they are macrocytes. And therefore, when they uh, become uh, um, a good in number in the circulation, then they will cause a shift in the uh, size of the red cells towards macrocytosis. And you will have a picture which will, of course, be uh, anemia and uh, macrocytosis. And therefore, this will also, or a, a case of hemolytic anemia, uh, when seen following uh, an episode of hemolysis can also resemble that of a nutritional anemia as far as CBC is concerned. And uh, of course, and here also you can see uh, uh, what you call hypersegmented neutrophils and therefore there can be a confusion because of that. And we'll look at that a little later, but it is important for us to realize that sometimes distinguishing between these three entities like distinguishing between these entities on the left uh, in the microcity group uh, can be very uh, dicey. Then you have the uh, group of conditions where you have normocytic anemia. In other words, the cells or the red cells are normal in size. And these are, as I said, anemia of chronic disorders in the early stages. Uh, in patients of renal failure, even acute renal failure of some standing can have, uh, uh, you know, normocytic anemia. A plastic anemia is a very good example of normocytic anemia. Uh, hemolytic anemia, which has been of long standing, uh, but uh, and and uh, is past the acute uh, hemolysis uh, for some time. In that case, the in a steady state, uh, chronic hemolytic conditions can present as normocytic normocytic anemia. And as mentioned here, uh, in a third of elderly people above 70 years, uh, for some unknown reasons, and possibly because of the marrow's uh, reduced ability to produce uh, hemopoietic cells, particularly the red cells, you do get normocytic anemia. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the challenges uh, happen or are faced when even if you are seeing uh, a certain type of red cells in the peri peripheral blood of patient who is anemic, because of these uh, overlapping features uh, uh, in the various entities that we have just now looked at. And that is what is listed here. And I'll be spending some time uh, trying to give you some insights into the distinction between these entities which are listed here. Uh, because these are the ones which will cause a problem in diagnosis uh, in a day-to-day -day practice. So we'll look at the uh, distinction between uh, iron deficiency anemia, beta thalassemia trait, and anemia of chronic disorder of some standing. Uh, partially treated iron deficiency anemia will be a problem because uh, if the patient receives hematinics, uh, even though uh, and in sub suboptimal quantities. Uh, in that case, even though he is deficient in iron or he may be a simple case of iron deficiency, uh, because of this kind of uh, partial therapy, uh, the entity, the various um, you know, laboratory parameters that we look at uh, 
or uh, investigate to make a diagnosis will get vitiated by the uh, interference that will happen from the uh, therapy that this patient would have received. And as a result of that, a uh, firm diagnosis can sometimes be very difficult, although clinically one may suspect a case to be iron deficient. But uh, when you look at the uh, lab results, uh, they do not support such a diagnosis. So for example, um, the patient may be receiving uh, hematinic and as a result of which the uh, B12 level may be high, the patient may have a high serum ion and uh, yet high TIBC. So in this kind of a condition, a high TIBC in a patient who also has a high or normal serum ion uh, due to the therapy that the patient has already received would indicate uh, to the possibility of iron deficiency anemia um, if, if uh, one sees the um, TIBC uh, to be high. So there are ways of uh, distinguishing these uh, entities, but uh, uh, prime of SI, there can be problems in diagnosis. Uh, we'll look at the anemia of chronic disorder in uh, some detail. Uh, we uh, will see, as I was mentioning, the issues that we face in distinguishing uh, a case of nutritional and megaloblastic anemia uh, uh, from uh, that of a hemolytic anemia, or for that matter, the plastic anemia. Uh, and of course, uh, anemia of chronic disorders, of which uh, chronic renal disease is an entity, uh, we'll look at that as well. And some of the exotic uh, enzymopathies other than G6PD and uh, pyruvate kinase, which uh, are not easy to diagnose. And those are entities which are diagnosed by uh, exclusion because the, uh, uh, the various investigations that are required to carry out uh, uh, diagnosis of these cases are not available in most of the labs in this country. And therefore, these are they remain undiagnosed. Yet they will have episodes of uh, mild yet chronic hemolysis uh, punctuated by episodes of uh, you know, hemolytic uh, crisis, maybe even. And therefore, uh, these patients, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, do not receive the kind of attention or the management that they would have otherwise received had their diagnosis been made with confidence. So without spending much time on the uh, CBC uh, result of uh, a case of iron deficiency, uh, what um, is important is to appreciate that the red cell count will be low, the hemoglobin will be low, and almost all the other red cell parameters are low, except the red cell distribution width, which is high. In contrast to that, uh, uh, we'll see later what happens in the cases of beta thalassemia, as in this slide. Uh, the red cell count is high. Uh, and of course, the uh, MCV is low, but it's not very low. And MCH in this particular case is low. But usually it is mildly reduced, so is the MCHC, or both are normal. So, and the reason for that is that the uh, problem in uh, beta thalassemia trait is the small size of the red cells, which are not badly hemoglobinized. And therefore, although the uh, MCH can be low even because of the microcytosis, uh, usually it is not very low because there's no. Uh, hypochromasia per cell and therefore MCHC is also normal in these conditions. So this is something which we need to look at and keep in mind. And as you can see here, just on the basis of the uh, red cell indices, in contrast to what we see in the uh, in iron deficiency, uh, you can immediately suspect that this is a case uh, very likely to be that of beta thalassemia trait because the red cell count is high and anemia is also not a severe degree and this is a male therefore the person is mildly anemic uh, and yet he has a very high red cell count and uh, microcytosis so this is something which um, is very typically seen uh, in these conditions but the point i would like to highlight here is the fact that this person also has a high uh, uh, you know uh, rdw 
which is 17.45. Uh, and the reason uh, possibly in this case uh, is that the person may also be having a mild degree of concomitant iron deficiency. And we have seen that, and there, there are publications, and we have also published our data to show that in uh, patients of beta thalassemia trait uh, who have uh, concurrent iron deficiency, the RDW tends to go up. Although some of the features or most of the features of uh, beta thalassemia trait, as far as the red cell indices are concerned, uh, are retained. Uh, and this is something which can be useful because uh, the component of iron deficiency, which uh, is treatable, if one can treat uh, in a patient who is uh, not like this case, another patient who is uh, more anemic, uh, the degree of anemia maybe will improve because of iron therapy. And uh, beta thalassemia trait is not uh, a condition where there is so much of iron overloading. Uh, and therefore, iron therapy, and this is a paradox though, uh, that you can get iron deficiency in beta thalassemia trait patients. And you can correct that component of iron deficiency with uh, the help of uh, iron supplementation and the patient will improve to the extent that uh, the iron deficiency was causing uh, uh, in terms of the uh, drop in the hemoglobin. So this is something which we can look at uh, uh, and uh, you know handle that uh, in that manner. And this uh, slide I uh, wanted to uh, share with you basically to highlight the point just now I made was that the uh, red cell count in IDA is uh, reduced while it is normal or high uh, for the age of and sex of the patient with beta thalassemia trait. MCV is usually very low, while in beta thalassemia trait it is uh, not so low as we saw. MCHC would be again low in IDA, but it is usually normal or mildly reduced in beta thalassemia trait. MCHC is uh, low in patients of IDA, while it is again either normal, usually it is normal and in fact. And this is the point I wanted you to, uh, you know, pay your attention to, that is RDW, wherein uh, we showed that an RDW of 17.1 uh, usually indicates that the patient um, has, um, uh, in, is more than 17.1 uh, would indicate that the patient in all probability has um, uh, iron deficiency anemia if the other parameters are being uh, fulfilled. Uh, but very importantly, what we noticed also was that patients of beta thalassemia trait who have concurrent iron deficiency uh, had uh, this RDW uh, of 17.1 and above. And that is something which was very striking and statistically significant. And uh, one could then derive various uh, discriminating indices based on this observation and the red cell count or other red cell indices, which then increase the predictive value of the discriminant factor in terms of distinguishing patients of iron deficiency anemia from beta thalassemia trait, pure beta thalassemia trait, and uh, those two from beta thalassemia trait in conjunction with uh, iron deficiency or having concurrent iron deficiency anemia. <clears throat> so this is something which I thought uh, would be of interest to some of you at least. Now that brings us to a very interesting um, observation and I think the most of you who read bone marrow smears would have noticed that there are islands or colonies of uh, erythroblasts or uh, intermediate late normoblasts in fact around macrophages in normal bone marrows and more so in bone marrows which uh, are of patients uh, uh, where there is erythroid hyperplasia due to reactive uh, erythropoiesis in response to either therapy or patients of iron deficiency anemia and even sometimes in, um, bit, uh, in hemolytic anemias. Now, what it actually tells us is that there is a, a very close interaction uh, so much so that it looks a physical interaction between the macrophages which store iron and the erythroid precursors which are uh, surrounding the 
uh, macrophage, as you can see in this case. And this is what we call as rophiocytosis. And what it does is it allows uh, transfer of iron in the form of uh, plain iron or even uh, iron bound to um, transferrin to come out of the uh, macrophages and de get delivered to the erythroid precursors uh, that are synthesizing hemoglobin. So this is something which uh, is a very interesting phenomenon. And also, uh, as you'll appreciate that uh, this is one of the ways that the erythroid precursors get their iron from um, the macrophages and synthesize hemoglobin. But they also are bathed in uh, in the uh, blood that is, uh, you know, surrounding these cells in the bone marrow. And through that, uh, transferrin, which is uh, carrying iron, gets also transferred uh, to the these erythroid precursors via uh, a receptor, which is known as a transferrin receptor. And it has been shown that uh, whenever there is increase in the size of the erythron, and also when there is erythroid hyperplasia, there is upregulation of transferrin receptor on the surface of the erythroid precursors, and and this also uh, circulates in the uh, in the plasma or the serum as free uh, transferrin receptor, and it can be measured. So uh, the level of transferrin receptor in the blood is a good indicator of the degree of uh, erythropoiesis in a given situation. Of course, in the context of uh, which entity or disease entity you are looking at. So in, it has been shown that in patients who have iron deficiency anemia, the level of circulating free serum transferrin receptor increases significantly, while on the other side, patients of anemia of chronic disorders where the erythron actually shrinks and because of the various mediators that are circulating in the um, circulation in patients of anemia of chronic disorders these are usually these are various cytokines uh, the transferrin receptor expression by the um, nrvcs is um, also uh, down regulated and as a result of that the uh, serum transferrin receptor level in anemia of chronic disorder decreases and it offers us a very uh, very ex uh, nice example or parameter uh, to distinguish between these two entities when confronted with a patient of anemia of chronic disorder who has a microcytic anemia and uh, uh, one is not sure whether the uh, patient has um, iron deficiency or anemia of chronic disorder or a, a combined entity of iron deficiency in a patient of anemia of chronic disorder. So serum transferrin receptor can be of great help in sorting this out. And I would again share some uh, information that we had uh, gathered and published uh, about 15 years back, uh, which will be of interest to uh, many of you because it does tell you how uh, iron deficiency, as in the case of beta thalassemia trait, uh, alters the picture uh, more towards the iron deficiency uh, uh, that you will see a similar kind of a phenomenon happening in patients of anemia of chronic disorder with concomitant iron deficiency. And this is a, a diagrammatic representation of what happens in anemia of chronic disorders and why is it that the patients of anemia of chronic disorder become uh, anemic? Now, in uh, macrophages, as we nowadays hear a lot about macrophages because of COVID-19 infection and its uh, role in generating IL-6, also have a major role to play in other types of infections and uh, certainly in chronic disorders. And uh, the IL-6 that is liberated by these cells have uh, an influence or effect on the hepatocytes in terms of enhanced production of what we call as hepcidin, which is a protein which is synthesized by the uh, liver cells. And these uh, molecules have uh, a regulatory effect uh, 
on the uh, ion metabolism in a sense that they have an inhibitory effect or uh, suppressing effect. And how do they do that? Is that, as you can see here, uh, macrophages are also a very important store of uh, iron. And they release iron, whatever they uh, uh, you know store as a result of senescence of red cells, which then get engulfed by the macrophages in the RE system. And then they get um, digested and the iron gets liberated. And that iron is ready to be pushed out of the macrophages uh, to be utilized by the erythroid uh, because, as you can see here in the blood vessel, in the uh, form of a blue solid circle. Uh, so that uh, is that's an erythroid precursor which is receiving iron in the form of uh, transferring iron uh, or transferring uh, carrying iron. And uh, that uh, is happening because the iron is getting pushed out of the macrophages through a, a, a channel which is called ferroportin. Uh, and what uh, hepcidin does is it comes and blocks this ferroportin channel, as a result of which there is uh, uh, poverty, I mean, plenty kind of a scenario wherein within the macrophage iron tends to collect and accumulate, and it is not able to come out. And on the other side, the erythroid precursors sitting in the sinusoids and uh, you know around the uh, uh, macrophages are not able to get iron and therefore they get deprived of iron. Uh, so this is something which is also therefore causing reduced production of uh, uh, you know, uh, hemoglobin and as a result of which the uh, cells become microcytic and hypochromic. And that's the reason why over time in patients of anemia of chronic disorders you have microcytic uh, red cells. And not only here, but also in terms of the absorption of iron by the small intestine uh, cells lining the small intestines. There also there is this uh, ferroportin channel at the base of these cells. And that also will get blocked by the hepcidin and cause the same kind of a scenario wherein although the uh, intestinal lining cells uh, or epithelial cells are absorbing iron, not able to deliver the iron outside the cell and into the circulation um, and thereby causing a deprivation of the hemopoietic or rather erythroid uh, cell elements of iron and uh, reduced hemoglobin synthesis results. And uh, this uh, table of course shows how uh, in various kinds of uh, chronic disorders like infection, inflammation, cancer, autoimmune disorders, um, chronic rejection of grafts, and of course chronic uh, renal failure, uh, varying uh, degree of incidence of anemia is encountered going up to the extent of 95% in the patients with acute and chronic infection. Um, so the prevalence of this uh, entity in anemia uh, in sorry in uh, chronic disorders is very high and therefore the magnitude of the problem has to be appreciated and um, this has to be therefore handled and as uh, one would appreciate that uh, you know giving iron when there is actually no iron deficiency uh, will not help because here the problem is being caused by the hepcidin uh, and yet, if there is an element of iron deficiency coexisting in these people as well, I mean, that is uh, very easy to imagine because uh, if we have an incidence of, uh, in general, of iron deficiency of, say, 50% uh, amongst women, and these women develop uh, an, uh, you know, chronic disorder, they would have pre-existing iron deficiency anyway. And on top of that, they have got chronic disorders. And therefore, both these entities then aggravate each other and uh, result in maybe a degree of anemia which is much more severe than had this been only due to chronic disorders. Uh, 
And therefore, if one can tackle the component of anemia, which is due to pre-existing iron deficiency, one can at least uh, give, give some uh, succor to these people, uh, these patients, uh, in terms of improving their hemoglobin to the extent uh, that is caused by the, uh, you know, the component of iron deficiency. So this is a logic which, uh, you know, one would uh, explore. And in fact, this is something which is now realized to be a reality. And patients of uh, anemia of chronic disorders do receive iron therapy just to take care of the deficiency component. And of course, tackle the uh, basic disease or the uh, chronic disease that is causing, uh, in addition uh, to iron deficiency, the anemia component that is linked to the, this uh, disorder per se. So this is something which we need to keep in mind. And here also, as I was saying, we did conduct some studies. And as you can see here, uh, the transferrin receptor, which is very uh, nice to, uh, is a very useful entity to look at in anemia of chronic disorders uh, and in iron deficiency anemia compared to normals. You can, if you can see the last column under TR, you can see that the normal range of transferrin receptor circulating free transferrin receptor is uh, 1.3 to 3 uh, microgram per liter. While in patients of uh, the iron deficiency anemia, it is uh, from uh, 4.2 to 19.2. And in patients with ACD uh, uh, and uh, uh, anemia of chronic disorder, it is uh, 9, 0.9 to 3. And in patients of anemia of chronic disorder with uh, increased transferrin uh, uh, receptor level, or in other words, indicating deficiency of iron, the value was, you can, I don't know if you can see, is very close to that of iron deficiency anemia, meaning thereby that patients who are of uh, anemia of chronic disorder but have increased transferrin receptor level would in all priority be having a, a, a combined uh, iron deficiency and anemia of chronic disorder. And therefore, the, uh, these are the ones who would benefit from iron supplementation compared to those anemia uh, patients of anemia of chronic disorder where the transferrin receptor is low, uh, meaning that thereby that they are classic cases of uh, anemia of chronic disorder not having possibly uh, an, uh, an associated iron deficiency also. And uh, this, the ratio between these two sets of patients is almost 50%. So by analogy, it would uh, make sense to say that at least in 50% of patients of anemia of chronic disorder, uh, wherein the uh, transferrin receptor levels are high, possibly there is iron deficiency. And therefore, they are the ones, uh, based on the results of our transferrin receptor level, the ones who would deserve to be treated uh, with iron supplementation. So this is something which, again, uh, is an uh, interesting observation and uh, something which was uh, also um, appreciated by the readership of this, journal, this article uh, in this particular journal. So this is something which I thought I'll also share with you because these are the situations where additional investigations and knowledge of the intricacies of the various interactions uh, of uh, factors that cause anemia uh, will be very helpful in managing such patients. And uh, this is again listed here, as you can see here, as I mentioned earlier, that when you have, uh, like in beta thalassemiatrate, uh, having iron deficiency here also, anemia of chronic disorders with iron deficiency, the last column, will show that the various uh, parameters of these patients is very similar to that of iron deficiency uh, in contrast to pure anemia of chronic disorders, where the parameters show a different kind of uh, result. So this is something which um, one needs to keep in mind and manage the patients accordingly. I think I'll skip this uh, diagram uh, or flowchart because I think we are running a uh, little behind schedule and we should have some time for question and answer. So we'll now move on to uh, an entity which is not a very common condition, but uh, still causes a lot of uh, diagnostic problem because of the fact that 
patients of uh, seroblastic anemia also tend to present as microcytic anemia. And uh, one, of course, is aware of uh, the fact that there are many conditions uh, wherein ingestion uh, of certain types of drugs, uh, uh, or even we have seen cases of patients receiving traditional medicine <coughs> uh, medicines, uh, patients who are alcoholics, uh, who are deficient in vitamin 6 or obviously drugs which cause uh, deficiency of vitamin 6 like um, anti-tuberculous drugs, INH and things like that. Uh, they uh, uh, tend to develop uh, what we call a sideroblastic anemia in which uh, what happens is that the conjugation of heme uh, with globin, which happens in the uh, mitochondria, uh, is hampered. This uh, function is hampered. As a result of which, the uh, you know the heme remains unutilized, and the uh, hemoglobin synthesis also decreases because this conjugation doesn't take place. And the he heme is a protein uh, is a, uh, a protoporphine, not not exactly a protein. Uh, which contains iron and therefore in mitochondria because it's not getting utilized heme tends to collect and gets dis degraded and intracellular collection of uh, iron increases and therefore the uh, if you stain um, erythroid precursors in these conditions you will see that uh, sites where the mitochondria are located you tend to get positive reaction uh, for iron staining and that um, appears as what we call as uh, sideroblasts. In other words, sidero stands for iron. So blast cells or erythroblasts, which contain iron in, the, in their cytoplasm. And they are actually present inside the mitochondria. Uh, so this is much more common. And why this is important is because if you know the cause, if you know the reason for uh, uh, secondary cerebroblastic anemia, uh, which are pretty commonly uh, found reasons, then you can treat that. In contrast to that, patients who are having primary, what we call as primary acquired cerebroblastic anemia, where the entity is acquired, but it is not due to any other disease or any other, you know, uh, substance or toxin that is causing or affecting the conjugation of him with globin. This is in this condition, the uh, sidrotic granules get deposited within the erythroid precursors because of uh, an inherent mechanism related failure. Um, and uh, that is a part of the disease process and not caused by any external agency or external uh, agent or uh, external entity. So this is something which we need to also be aware of and very good examples are uh, pre-leukemia or myelodysplastic syndromes wherein uh, one of the entities uh, of uh, idiopathic refractory anemia is associated with uh, sideroblast formation and these sideroblasts, uh, these entities are also called ring sideroblasts because they tend to collect around the nucleus where uh, the site of mitochondrial location is uh, which is around the nuclear out outline uh, and therefore they look like a ring of uh, Prussian blue dots and that is what uh, that's what gives them the name uh, ring pseudoblasts and we'll see some examples of that and uh, these entities whether it's an anemia of chronic disorder or uh, pseudoblastic anemia uh, and of course hemolytic anemia and things like that you have increased iron store, uh, which is because of the uh, either, uh, as I mentioned, un underutilized iron in the process of synthesis of um, hemoglobin, or increased, um, uh, you know, retention of iron, or increased, uh, you know, deposition of iron. So any of these entities can give rise to increased iron store, which can be measured with the help of uh, a very nice uh, staining process called pulse staining uh, of the bone marrow sample. And you can see the iron store 
uh, in the uh, bone marrow particles or spicules. <laughs> and in conditions of uh, ring pseudoblasts, as you can see, your pseudoblastic anemia so with ring pseudoblasts, you can see these uh, erythroid precursors, which are on the in person in the right side panel, uh, having bluish dots, and as if they are in the form of a ring. So this is something which, when we see, uh, we call this as a condition of uh, pseudoblastic anemia, either primary acquired or secondary, depending on the possible etiology. <clears throat> And this is a very, you know, telltale kind of a morphology, which is something which you cannot miss. Now, coming to macrocytic anemia, again, uh, I don't want to spend too much time here. Most of you are familiar with this kind of picture. When we see that, we uh, know that this is in all priority a case of nutritional megaloblastic anemia. Uh, uh, and if it is supported by the CBC results, uh, there is not too many things that you need to do. You can do a serum vitamin B12 folic acid assay or itself and or a cell folate assay and make a firm diagnosis and treat the patient. And this is the kind of picture, blood picture you'll see, wherein in this particular case, as you can see here, the MCV is very high, 122. And this patient has accompanying uh, pancytopenia in the sense that the platelet count is also low and uh, you know the WFC count is also low, uh, which is a common phenomenon in patients of nutritional megaloblastic anemia. So that should not surprise you. But at the same time, if you do not have a, uh, an access to the peripheral blood smear, which as you saw is typically uh, you know, indicative of uh, uh, nutritional megaloblastic anemia because of the fact that you have these oval um, macro sites, macro ovalocytes, hypersemic neutrophils, Havel jolly bodies, teardrop cells, which are very typically seen in patients of nutritional megaloblastic anemia. But if you do not have access to a peripheral blood smear, this kind of a picture can be seen also in patients of aplastic anemia or patients of hemolytic anemia uh, following uh, a hemolysis when the reticulocyte count is very high. And uh, you know, you can get, of course, the lowering of the white cell count and platelets as a coincidental finding. So just by looking at the CBC um, data, you cannot make a diagnosis. You will have to, of course, get into the uh, other details. And this is, again, therefore, a dilemma that we face in, uh, practically in real life. Uh, this is a bone marrow picture of a megaloblastic anemia, nutritional again, because you can see giant uh, band cell here almost uh, again another giant band cell and uh, you can these are all typically seen in a giant metamyelocyte in a case of nutrition anemia. so when you look at uh, the morphology of the peripheral blood and bone marrow you can make a diagnosis um, but it is uh, not always necessary to do a bone marrow in a patient of nutritional and megaloblastic anemia when actually you can make a diagnosis from the peripheral blood, uh, um, blood count as well as uh, you know, peripheral blood smear supported by other investigations. And that is what uh, I have highlighted here that uh, there are several features which are common between nutritional megaloblastic anemia, hemolytic anemia, and and therefore, diagnosis is not necessarily always easy, uh, but you can uh, look at the condition, uh, uh, the features which are not com common between the two. And these are important to look at. Say, for example, leukopenia and thrombocytopenia usually is not seen in hemolytic anemia unless it is accompanied by uh, a plastic crisis. The, uh, Ovalocytosis is something which is seen in nutritional megaloblastic anemia, not seen in hemolytic anemia. Polychromatic macrocytes will be seen in hemolytic anemia, but not in nutritional anemia. Reticulocyte count will be high in hemolytic anemia, but not in uh, you know, nutritional megaloblastic anemia. And of course, the other uh, associated features which may give rise to nutritional megaloblastic anemia, uh, such as um, uh, anti intrinsic cell. Uh, and intrinsic factor antibodies, antiparietals and antibodies and things like that. And of course, level of sitium, vitamin B12, folic acid and red cell folate will resolve uh, the issue in case uh, 
the patient has not received these uh, uh, these uh, you know supplementations i think we are left with very little time now so i will quickly go through just the last uh, two three slides uh, which are actually dealing with patients of uh, uh, chronic renal failure and uh, in chronic uh, renal failure or chronic kidney disease the uh, reasons for anemia can be multifold and that is what is listed here and unlike anemia of chronic disorders here you have multiple other reasons including loss of blood uh, uh, you know then sometimes associated hematological other disorders uh, 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 hormonal disorders like hyperparathyroidism uh, uh, some element of hemolysis and all that they compli complicate the scenario to a large extent and therefore uh, a patient of anemia um, which is happening in a patient um, of chronic renal uh, disorder is not a simple entity to make a diagnosis of and obviously these patients will have to be investigated uh, thoroughly to reach a proper diagnosis so that one can um, you know address the uh, the underlying reasons for uh, which cause this kind of a complex scenario and these are the tests that one would like to do and finally just uh, to uh, complete the list uh, we are aware that in G6PD deficiency we have uh, precipitation of hemoglobin inside the cell which then tend to attach to the cell membrane in the form of Heinz bodies which you can demonstrate by supravital staining and when these get engulfed or uh, taken out or bitten off by the uh, reticular endothelial system in the spleen and liver you get what we call as the bite cells which literally mean that a part of the red cell has been bitten off by the phagocytes while removing these uh, unwieldy hemoglobin, uh, you know, precipitated hemoglobin, then the red cells are trying to uh, pass through the sinusoids in the RE system. And this is very typically seen in uh, G6PD deficiency. Uh, but what is uh, the problem is that uh, G6PD deficiency, pyruvate kinase deficiency can be picked up uh, to an extent uh, without much fuss. But we are still left with a host of conditions which are uh, due to uh, less commonly encountered or less common red cell enzyme deficiencies. And one of them you can suspect, of course, is uh, pyrimidine 5 nucleosidase deficiency, wherein you will see very beautiful basophilic stippling in the peripheral blood smear in the red cells. And if, when you see that, other than lead poisoning, one has to keep in mind this differential diagnosis of five nucleotide, pyrimidine five nucleotide deficiency. Uh, so this is something which I thought I should uh, bring to your attention. And uh, there was one case. When do we have time to get through that, or should we stop now? Uh, sir, I think we can take a couple of minutes to just uh, take, and we can take a question for the next ten minutes. Okay. So this I just thought I will share. Uh, real life experience that I've had when I was working at uh, Duja Hospital. One of our colleagues, uh, uh, lady uh, aged 53 years, uh, was a known case of uh, beta thalassemia trait as uh, because she used to get investigated in our lab. And uh, she uh, had a, a last known, she had a hemoglobin A2 level of 3.8%, which is in the beta thalassemia range and of course, uh, normal fetal hemoglobin. But when she came back to us with the present or the last complaint, she had developed lethargy, easy fatigability and palpitation on exertion, unsteady gait and a pressure band around the ankles. Uh, the last two indicated that there is some neurological uh, you know, manifestation of a disease which was evolving because she developed, uh, she was otherwise very fit. And then she developed all these, uh, you know, easy fatigability and palpitation, obviously, because of the uh, ongoing or increasing anemia. As CBC, uh, at that time, I'll show you the table, uh, which will show the various values, uh, showed at that time a significant drop in the hemoglobin. And that explains why she had the 
lethargy, easy fatigability, palpitation, and all that stuff. And uh, uh, decrease in the white cell count also, but an increase in the MCV and RDW, meaning thereby that she had a beta thalassemia trait kind of a uh, MCV, which was low uh, with red high red cell count, but now she had an MCV which was in the normal range. Uh, so that cannot happen just like that. In a patient of beta thalassemia trait, when uh, many of us have seen that they continue to have microcytosis and high red cell count for the rest of their lives. So this was kind of a warning bell in this case. And therefore, we investigated her further. And what we see in this smear is that she had dimorphic red cell population. Uh, there was marked anisopoikilocytosis and very beautiful macro velocides, which were not polychromatic. Uh, there were hypersemented neutrophils and a, a normal platelet count. The, the reticulocyte count was low. Uh, and, and therefore, the possibility of a hemolytic anemia in the absence of polychromatic uh, macrocytes and low retic count was very low on the cards. Uh, then the serum ion was high, which of course, um, thalassemia trait also happens. Um, and TIBC also was in the normal range, a little on the higher side of the normal. Uh, and there was a mild, um, direct, indirect reacting hyperbilirubinemia, which is something which uh, we see in patients of uh, megaloblastic anemia, not so much in beta thalassemia trait, pure. You know, pure cases, we don't see that kind of a hyperbilirubinemia. So what it told us at that, that point in time, that there's something which has happened to this lady, which has led to the development of possibly a megaloblastic anemia which caused neutralization of some of the features of beta thalassemia trait red cell morphology, whereby the red cell count went down, the MCV became normal, uh, the RDW became increased. And I think uh, that, is, that is what we were suspecting at that time. So we did a, a serum vitamin B12 level, which was extremely low. And uh, serum folic acid uh, was high which is again something which we see in patients of uh, uh, you know between b12 deficiency uh, direct cum test was negative and anti parietal cell and anti microsomal antibodies were positive and the um, anti microsomal antibody titer was 1 in 6400 which is very high uh, anti intrinsic factor blocking antibody was absent and so was anti mitochondrial antibody a biopsy of the gastric fungus was also done which showed superficial gastritis and now if you look at the uh, evolving disease as far as the cbc is concerned when this was her older picture which we uh, kind of took out from our file uh, wherein you can see a nice almost typical beta thalassemia trait kind of a picture wherein of course the uh, mcv was low but not very low Hemoglobin was okay for a female, almost a little less than normal. Red cell count was on the higher side of normal for a female. And um, RDW was um, you know, mildly increased. So this was also not very typically that of a beta thalassemia trait person. So whatever was the reason that caused this change in the second column, if you can see in June of 1996, you can see that the red cell count went down drastically to 2.5 million and um, hemoglobin to 6.5 when she first was seen um, after she developed uh, an aggravation of her condition, which I just now described to you. Uh, the MCV was normal compared to earlier MCV and um, the RDW went up very high. So now, uh, uh, of course, this is the time when we made a diagnosis of uh, her being a case of pernicious anemia, uh, which uh, of course, uh, maybe she developed it over time because she also very interestingly uh, had experienced drooping of her eyelids around that time. And then she got investigated and was found to have myasthenia gravis as well. So she had this autoimmune uh, kind of a profile wherein she had myasthenia gravis as well as pernicious anemia. And that developed on top of her earlier pre-existing beta thalassemia trait, which then changed her picture of 
the CBC to such an extent that suppose she had presented to us at this level or to another lab or another nation uh, with, um, you know, as she presented in June and not knowing the previous history, one would may really get puzzled and make all kinds of diagnosis. And very interestingly, then, of course, because we had the hindsight of her, uh, of knowing that she was a case of beta thalassemia trait, we could infer what was going on and therefore investigate her on those lines, which maybe another lab would not have or another physician would not have done that way, uh, or she would have lost time. So this is something which I thought is a very excellent uh, lesson that we need to uh, you know, learn from uh, this kind of cases where uh, we should really look at all aspects of the patient's uh, you know, history, and very importantly, the past history history of the patient. <clears throat> so very interestingly now, if you see after treatment, just one and a half months, almost uh, five weeks later, her um, blood picture totally changed to a very classic beta thalassemia trait. As you can see here, the red cell count went up, went up to 5.4 million. Hemoglobin, of course, was a little low. But look at the microcytosis it went down from even 76 in the first uh, you know, pre uh, aggravation scenario to now, it was more typical of beta thalassemia trait, and the RTW came down into less than 17 or seven less than 17.1 range, and she, you know, became a typical beta thalassemia trait after being treated with uh, vitamin B12 supplementation. So this is something which I thought I'll share with you, and also therefore share uh, share with you the dilemmas uh, that we face when we are. Uh, presented with uh, a case which otherwise may look a straightforward iron deficiency or with a trait. But when you look into the details of the various laboratory parameters, you may see some uh, things which are jutting out. You know, they don't fit into the uh, uh, into the puzzle, like, uh, you know, correct pieces. And in that case, we must investigate these patients further and try and resolve the uh, cause of uh, anemia in these patients because otherwise uh, they will be managed only partially and uh, after managing maybe one aspect you will come to know about the existence of another aspect or another entity and then uh, you know you treat that later on and then the patient loses time in the process so it's very important therefore for us to also see uh, these uh, overlapping syndromes as if to be able to uh, you know, make a diagnosis, comprehensive diagnosis, and offer to the patient the right kind of therapy that is, uh, you know, uh, they deserve. So I think uh, with that, I'll stop here and would love to answer if there are some queries or questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that uh, amazing presentation. We have a time for a quick few questions. Uh, so one question that's been put up uh, is uh, regarding cutoffs that may be able to differentiate between iron deficiency anemia and beta thalassemia. Uh, so there have been some questions about whether RDW can be used, whether MCV can be used. I'd personally also like to expand the question to see, uh, to know your opinion on if uh, are there any particular indices that you prefer, like Menzers or Segals or Carvalho index. So is there anything that you particularly use and what is the usage that you think these indices or uh, parameters may have in differentiating between the two? Yes, that's a <clears throat> very good question and something which is, of course, known for decades now. Um, but uh, I personally do not, uh, you know, run after these indices or various, uh, you know, the discriminating factors that we earlier used to call them. Uh, but as I mentioned, if you look at the total picture and take into account the, <clears throat> because all these indices do not take into account everything that you can look at, they take into account one or two of these parameters and then they derive the indices or the discriminating factors. But personally, I would like to look at uh, the hemoglobin level, the uh, you know the red cell count, uh, the RDW, the MCH, the MCHC, all of that. And when you look at all of that, you get a much better idea of the you know the possibility of uh, a case being death assessment rate or and deficiency, or when more importantly, a mixed kind of a scenario, which you will not be able to pick up if you just strictly went by these. Uh, discriminating factors or 
various indices that just now you mentioned. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question that's been asked is, are there any tips you can give on how to differentiate or how to detect mixed nutritional anemia just from a CBC? Uh, so mixed nutritional anemia means uh, a person who is iron deficient as well as vitamin B12 folic acid deficient. Yes, so <clears throat> in that case, you will get a picture which is like what I just now showed you in this lady, uh, wherein uh, uh, two opposite forces which uh, give rise to uh, diagonally opposite, uh, you know, red cell pictures in the CBC. When they are present together, they give you a midway kind of a scenario. So uh, when you see a patient who is, uh, you know, um, anemic yet has uh, normocytic red cell indices, of course, the red cell count will be low in uh, whenever there is both uh, iron deficiency as well as megaloblastic anemia. But red cell indices may be more like normocytic, normochromic. But if you look at the RDW, and very importantly in that case, you must look at the red cell histogram. So as we know that when you have a combined deficiency, uh, we call uh, this entity as a dimorphic kind of an anemia because in the peripheral blood smear as well as in the bone marrow maybe, you can see features of both the uh, entities being present in the sense that you will see microcytes as well as you will see macrocytes. So when you see this kind of a picture with the normocytic uh, red cell indi indices and uh, low hemoglobin, this would tell you in all probability this is a case of uh, mixed uh, you know, deficiency rather than uh, a normocytic normochromic anemia where the possibilities of uh, aplastic anemia, renal failure, chronic hemolytic anemia and things like that just now um, I described. So looking at the red cell indices and the red cell histogram uh, would be very important in these conditions. Uh, sir, I think we have uh, uh, one last question. Somebody has asked us now, what can you say, what would be the CBC findings in myelodysplastic syndrome? What would be the impression that you would be getting from SAT? Okay, so the, uh, see the myelodysplastic syndrome is not one entity. It is now, uh, you know, recognize that it's a mixed bag where you have different kinds of uh, you know, subtypes and various entities which together constitute myelodysplastic syndrome. So depending on what the patient has, uh, uh, say for example, as I said, that if the person has refractory sideroblastic anemia, uh, or uh, as we say, refractory anemia with ring sideroblast, there you will get a either a microcytic or normocytic or even macrocytic anemia you can get. And yet you will have to investigate further to see whether there is, uh, you know, in the marrow, of course, marrow will be an important uh, uh, investigation in this kind of a condition because whenever you have pancytopenia, marrow investigation becomes very important to know what is the condition of the marrow, whether it is producing or is it, uh, if at all, a uh, dysplastic marrow or is a hyperplastic marrow and depending on that the further management will happen but suppose a patient has uh, simply uh, you know as, as we call refractory anemia as a part of pale leukemia or myelodysplastic syndrome in that case he'll just have uh, anemia and nothing else he can have a normal uh, white cell count normal platelet count or varying degrees of uh, bicytopenia may also be there so depending on what type or what stage of myelodysplasia the patient is presenting uh, you will get the blood picture say for example uh, 5q syndrome you will get uh, you know a different type of picture the platelet count will be high so that way and again somebody who is evolving from uh, less uh, severe mds to a uh, in a transformation phase that patient will have a shift to the left in the peripheral blood maybe even though the count may be low and some immature cells in the of the white cell series in the peripheral circulation and there will be also an entity called uh, or there is an entity called uh, you know uh, myelodysplastic syndrome with excess of blast wherein you will see uh, borderline blast in the peripheral blood or in the marrow so depending on the type of the mds your blood picture will change and depending on that you will have to uh, make a diagnosis <clears throat>
Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that's all the time we have for now. I'd like to thank sir again for his wonderful, wonderful session, and then for all the attendees for joining us today and for their questions. Uh, we will be emailing you a link to the recording of this webinar. Uh, you will be able to watch the webinar at your convenience. Please, please feel free to forward the link to your colleagues who may have missed today's sessions. Especially, I guess, as I can see, many people have said that there has been probably due to the weather and other circumstances, there has been difficulties in connectivity for a lot of our uh, attendees. So this re uh, this recording will be mailed to you. Any further questions that we have not been able to address can be uh, sent to the email that you will find on the uh, email that will respond that you will get. There is a uh, an email will be there to which you can send the questions that you have, and we will answer as and when we can. Uh, till we meet again for another webinar, uh, stay masked, stay safe. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.